Welcome everybody to episode four of the Cinchi Learning Series. So happy to have you all here. Today's session we'll be covering off active metadata, understanding the magic behind the data fabric. Our host today is Dan Demers, our co-founder and CEO here at Cinchi. The idea that uh, intelligence is the new oil, it's what people are after, it's not so much the data. Uh, so uh, the fact that we have these learning uh, series as, as an example is a great way for us to grow our collective intelligence. Uh, so in the uh, first episode, uh, we covered uh, where a data fabric can fit uh, and sit inside of your target state architecture and uh, what does it uh, replace versus what does it augment and connect with. Uh, then we covered uh, aug app augmentation, making your existing applications smarter by connecting them to the fabric. Uh, and then last week, we covered the idea of autonomous data, managing data outside of an application. Uh, today, we're going to cover active metadata. It's the magic behind the data fabric. Uh, and uh, Robert, to your question, we can definitely get into some of the integration aspects of that. Uh, and uh, next week, we're going to be covering uh, the capability of creating cross-application APIs uh, in, uh, in the platform. An, an API is a query, is a report, so there's a unification phenomenon. Uh, that we'll go into uh, and show how you can do the equivalent of what would be uh, weeks of development and, and, and complete that in literally minutes. Uh, and then following that, we're going to cover the introduction of metadata forms, uh, which are pretty cool, where the forms adapt not only to data, but to the actual metadata itself, uh, including access controls and whatnot. So again, today uh, we're covering active metadata, uh, which is the magic behind uh, the data fabric. Uh, so first of all, quick refresher, uh, we talked about intelligence as the overall theme. Uh, what is enabling that in human intelligence is the idea of plasticity. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to cover this in depth. We've covered it before, but it's a good refresher around how really the design of a data fabric is really inspired off of how the, the brain works in terms of its ability to reorganize information. And you'll see uh, in a few minutes, this is uh, very relevant as it relates to the idea of metadata and more specifically active metadata. Uh, and the data fabric is uh, representing a major shift because it finally makes plasticity possible in the enterprise brain, whereas traditionally it is not possible. It's, it's uh, your model is rigid and brittle and, and uh, fragmented across hundreds of thousands of application specific data models. Uh, and uh, the way to think of a data fabric is uh, just how you think of a, of a sweater. You've got uh, uh, threads, horizontal, vertical, and uh, what you see with your eyes is the thread that raises to the surface. And, and that uh, individual thread uh, for the essentially a data cell may be coming from an individual uh, source. Uh, so you can see in this hypothetical record one, the first attribute comes from Salesforce. Uh, the second attribute comes from a different system called Outreach. The third one comes from a third system. Uh, the fourth comes from the same system as the second. And then the fifth one is managed as autonomous data where it is created natively on the fabric. Uh, but the second record, the second attribute can also be autonomous. So the whole idea is to an end user, they're interacting with uh, basically data uh, with full transparency in terms of where the data originated, uh, but they don't have to concern themselves with a complexities of integration. It's seamlessly blended uh, to create that fabric. And that's the role of the builder is to basically uh, use the, the technology almost like a loom to create the fabric and enable that uh, universal intuitive interface. Um, the where the fabric fits uh, in in your architecture uh, is very different than the traditional approach. So the, the whole premise again is that you're changing how you design net new systems. Uh, so the traditional approach is you're going to buy or build an app for that, uh, either extending an existing one or creating a net new one. And it doesn't matter if it's in the cloud or on prem. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's um, uh, the way that you architect it, if it's monolithic or client server or a three tier or N tier or service oriented architecture or microservices, uh, they all have an interface, either a human interface and or a system interface. Uh, they implement some type of logic, they have some type of controls, they need to remember information, so they use a data store for that to have persistence. Uh, and then they, of course, perform point to point integration, otherwise the system stands in isolation and no system ever does. Uh, the introduction of the data fabric now opens up the new usage patterns. Uh, it also makes plasticity possible. The first pattern we covered in a past session is the idea of taking existing legacy apps, 
uh, and connecting them to the fabric to make them smarter through the uh, introduction of plasticity. We demonstrated how to take Salesforce and make that more intelligent uh, uh, in, a, in a past session. Uh, then we talked about the idea of autonomous data. This is enabling you to create new application experiences without standing up new application specific data stores. Uh, and then the final thing that we talked about uh, at a high level is the idea of a metadata experience. And we're gonna get into that a little bit today uh, with the idea of active metadata. And you're gonna see a little bit of the experience, but we'll cover that more fulsomely uh, in, a, in a future session. Uh, and um, uh, so, so now we're going to get into the kind of the guts of the data fabric uh, and more specifically active metadata. But actually, before I do that, let me just pause and see if there's any questions on any, because uh, it's important that we're all on the same page in terms of kind of where the fabric sits and why metadata is important and specifically uh, why active metadata is important. But does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts on uh, on uh, on the architecture view of uh, where we see kind of the data fabric fitting. No, okay. Uh, all right. So if we zoom into the uh, fabric itself, uh, there's. Uh, a number of components, and you'll find, uh, like today, we're going to be showing you Cinchi as a data fabric, of course, but uh, there are other data fabrics, and you're going to find that there are similarities and, of course, differences. Uh, but uh, the various capabilities that uh, you would expect of a, of a fabric, uh, why don't we actually start at the bottom? Uh, the first would be the idea of creating a semantic model, that you're uh, creating a, a business representation of all of your knowledge. Uh, so what is a customer? What is an employee? And you're doing that incrementally. You're not doing that all as one project. You're doing that project by project and then changing that through uh, the plasticity capability. Uh, at the base of it all is metadata and active metadata, which we're going to go in depth on. But really, it's data about data. And active means it's real time and you can uh, kind of put it into action. You can get uh, value out of that metadata beyond it simply being static and stale. Uh, and uh, there's kind of an infinite uh, amount of uh, use cases that you could do with uh, instant access uh, that is real time, always up to date, uh, a view into all of your, of your metadata, technical as well as business. Uh, so we're going to come back to that. But on top of that, uh, in the fabric, you have the ability to create virtual tables, uh, which is uh, essentially a query that uh, may do, let's say, a, I don't know, a union of two other tables or a join and uh, expose that as if it were a table itself. Uh, similarly, you can have virtual columns, which are derived uh, attributes. Uh, so calculated columns would be an example of a, of a virtual. Uh, it's not coming from a system of, of record. It's created on, on the fabric itself. The ability to perform custom functions and calculations. Uh, the idea of a universal data query syntax. Uh, so uh, for example, our platform supports uh, SQL and, and REST and uh, OData and other protocols. But being able to really just interact with all data on the fabric, regardless if it's connected, regardless if it's uh, autonomous, and being able to do that essentially cross-application, uh, which is, a, you'll see there's a theme here of universal. Universal stand in for cross-application. Uh, in the same way that you can query data, you can also manipulate it. Uh, so uh, a data manipulation language is an example of a mechanism that you can use to, to manipulate data. Uh, of course, the, the queries and the uh, manipulation of data is, is subject to universal data security in terms of where data is physically stored, how it's encrypted in, in REST and, and in transit, as well as the enablement of universal controls that restrict what individual users, once authenticated, can see and change down to that data cell level. Uh, the ability to have universal data operations to streamline really the whole end-to-end uh, -end process of managing data and changing data and structures, uh, having standardized governance, having a universal data API, uh, and being able to do uh, change data capture event streaming for uh, real-time uh, connectivity with upstream and downstream sources into the fabric, uh, and then uh, data synchronization, where uh, generally you should expect a fabric to include uh, prepackaged connectors with the ability to build your own connectors, of course, uh, and those connectors can be real-time, they can be batched, they can be one way in, one way out, or bi-directional. Uh, so these are what we see as really those core capabilities. Uh, and uh, data synchronization would be um, um, kind of the more common use and, and essentially every project that you, you would deliver on it, you're going to use some form of synchronization uh, to connect data in or out. Um, any, any questions on, on this before we dive into active metadata? 
But Dan, I just had one with the data yep. governance. Can you put in some sort of privacy layer too? So some sales would be be sheltered uh, given yep. privacy access. Uh, for sure. So there's there's two elements. The uh, there's governance, and then there's the controls. So the yeah. The governance would be something as simple as uh, being able to classify data. Is this internal, restricted, is it PII, so on and so forth, as well as um, um, opening up really actually pretty cool possibilities that we'll cover a little bit today uh, on what you can do when you have visibility into your total universe of metadata, which is traditionally challenging. Uh, whereas the data controls are ultimately about restricting access based on data-driven uh, permissions that are uh, specified by the whoever ultimately owns the data. So using uh, the combination of those two, you can absolutely uh, say, for example, uh, if you're a salesperson in, in, let's say you work for Cinchi and we're using Cinchi, uh, you can only see um, leads and opportunities that are uh, in your assigned territory if we wanted to do it that way. Uh, and uh, you go even further and say, not only do they have to be in the assigned territory, but they have to be assigned to you as an individual person, such that should that be reassigned, maybe you don't have access to that. Now we probably wouldn't do it that way because you probably want to have shared access uh, within a territory, but it gives you that flexibility. So whoever ultimately owns the data, they're specifying down to, uh, they don't always have to go down to the cell level, but it gives them the ability to go down to the cell level to restrict what, not only what you can see, but also what you can change or what you can approve or what you can delete and give you that level of control. That's important. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Robert, you were also asking about the integration aspects of it, which is really around the event uh, streaming and uh, the synchronization. So just one other point on that, the, those universal controls also hold true even to systems that are connecting into the fabric. Uh, so for example, if I connect uh, my fabric to, I don't know, an on-prem Oracle database or to Salesforce, uh, that connector is going to run under credentials and those credentials will need access to the data on the fabric and that needs to be granted by the owner. So just because it's a system talking to the fabric doesn't mean it, it's a free-for-all, it has unrestricted access. It's under the same protection that a user logging into an interface would be, uh, which gives you as an owner that ultimate control. Okay, so metadata, it's a fairly commonly understood concept, but it's data that describes data. <laughs> uh, active, uh, you can see these are just the definitions from uh, uh, just doing quick Google, uh, but uh, being able to engage and be, or ready to engage in, in physical energetic pursuits. So it's really putting it into play, putting it into action. Uh, so you combine these two together, it's not static stale metadata, it's metadata that's moving, it's changing, and you're able to utilize it uh, almost like a weapon, uh, and you can weaponize your, your metadata. So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to jump in and actually show you uh, a little bit of under the covers of, of how uh, the fabric is actually managing uh, to do what it does. Um, uh, can you all still see my screen? Okay. I can. Okay. So uh, here you're seeing, um, again, our own uh, data fabric, and you're seeing all the nodes that exist that I have access to. Uh, and I've set the time to be in the present. So I'm looking at as it exists today, right here, right now. Uh, but uh, as you've seen in, in past demos, you can go back in time. So let me just drag that. And we're going to go all the way to the beginning. And we're going to spend a little bit more time uh, on uh, really what's actually happening here. So uh, this is uh, January 29th, 2018. This is the day that we installed the platform for our own internal use. Uh, so this was an older version, of course. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, this was actually even a pre-release version when, before it was in market. Uh, so if you were to install the latest, it would look a little bit different, uh, but the concepts are gonna be largely true. Uh, and uh, if you think about what's happening when you install it, there's nothing on the fabric. It doesn't know anything about your data. It's just empty. Uh, but the installation actually does load up some initial uh, data, some structures, as well as some data within those structures. Uh, but what that is, is that's the, the meta model. Uh, so the fabric is built on itself. And what that means is, uh, if you recall in, in the fabric, you have the idea of data tables. These are data sets. And those, those sets could be a blend of data from multiple sources, including autonomous. Uh, but every table is a separate entity. It's a separate thing. It's, it's something that uh, in theory should exist as a row of data in a catalog of tables. Uh, so one of the first things that happens when you install it is it creates a table to keep the list of all of the tables. 
including itself, which is kind of weird. It has a recursive architecture. Uh, so that's the tables table. Uh, the next thing that happens, and this is all part of the installation, is it's adding into that table a bunch of tables. So for example, uh, there's a table for domains, which are containers that uh, uh, tables as well as queries as well as experiences can be uh, grouped within for uh, organizing and, and establishing ownership. Uh, also, tables break down into columns. Uh, so you're seeing the table columns is actually another table. So the table columns exists as data inside of the tables table. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of others that we won't cover today. I'm going to really center around really just the entities and the attributes, so the tables and the columns today. Uh, but uh, as I go forward through time, uh, you can see as we add more nodes, we're now moving beyond just the the kind of the meta model. Uh, so there's the meta model there in yellow, uh, but now you're seeing other domains start to appear as we're adding real business data to it uh, in our use. So for example, we had uh, sales targets. This is before we were in market and, and we were just a couple of people, uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're targeting uh, US banks as an example. And these, these sets are all kind of uh, uh, fragmented. They're not all connected, uh, but then you're starting to see some connectivity here. But keep in mind that every node that you're seeing here exists as a row of data in the tables table. And if this has three columns, well, it has three rows of data in the table columns table. Uh, so that phenomena continues over time as we're adding more and more data, adding more and more queries, adding more and more uh, experiences. It's really just building that fabric out. Uh, but every table still exists as a row of data in the, in the tables table. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back uh, to the home screen and let's actually create uh, an ent entirely new table. And uh, let's actually look at what's happening under the covers as it relates to the metadata. Uh, so I'm going to create from scratch and I'm going to do a, a new table from scratch. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. And I'm just going to call this uh, test table. And I'm going to choose an icon. I'll just choose a, a red ambulance. I'll put it in a domain. I'll put it in our, our sandbox domain. And there's already a table that has that name. Uh, so let's see if I can call it a demo table or a demo table it is. Uh, and I can give it a description. Uh, now I'm going to just add a couple of columns here. So let's just say we have. Uh, I don't know, we're going to name uh, a row. We're going to put a description. Uh, I'm going to classify this data. I'll say that this one is internal. Uh, I'm going to say that the name is mandatory and has to be unique uh, and can also be keyed and linked into other columns. Uh, I'm going to add um, a value. I'll make that a number. I'll show that as, uh, as, as confidential and I'll make that uh, optional uh, and uh, not have a, a default value. And then I'll just add a, a choice uh, and I'll choose a choice and I'll just say option one, option two, uh, and I'll make that uh, public and I'll put a description here and the value. Of course, this is all mock, so this isn't going to make a whole lot of business sense, but uh, we'll see what the metadata under the covers is. Uh, and uh, let's add one more, which is a link. Uh, so let's link to another node that's already on the fabric. Uh, so in, uh, previously we've used uh, like currencies and countries because they're simple examples. Uh, so let's use one of those again. Let's do uh, country. So we're going to link to the country data set. Uh, so we're going to link to the country codes and I'm going to create that connection based on, I'll choose, let's say the ISO code. Uh, and I'll say that that's internal and I'll leave that as optional as well. Uh, so I'm now saving this table. So I've added a new node on the fabric. So if I were to re-render that visualization, you're going to see another circle. And that circle is going to have only one line. And that line is going to point to the country's table because it has that one link. So it's going to be a small circle. But if this were to start to become more centric uh, and have more connectivity, then it will grow in its mass. Uh, and it will be elevated in terms of being recommended to, to people. Uh, but I now have this data structure. And you can see there's no data in it. So I'll just put one sample row of data in here. So we've got uh, uh, Bob, uh, put a value there, choice. I can choose option one or option two. Uh, and a country, uh, so let's say we want the, uh, the US. And you can see that's a link. Uh, so I can click through to get to that. Uh, and if I change that, you're, of course, seeing the collaboration log, the fact that it's tracing and tracking all the changes. Uh, and I can roll back. So go from three back to the original value. And now we're back to that. Uh, but if I go back to the history, you can see it's actually just added version 6, but version 6 is the same version 4. Uh, and I'm showing you this for a reason, because you're going to see that this is even true for the metadata, not just the actual business data. Uh, so now that I've added that table, uh, let's actually look at what's happened under the covers. So I'm just going to open up a new window here, and 
Uh, let's uh, look at uh, the tables table, and then I'm going to open up the table columns table. Uh, now, these are just standard data tables, just like the one that I just created. Uh, so here I can, I'm a builder of Cinchi as a platform, so I can actually go into design mode and uh, I can change the design of how Cinchi's meta model works. So you can see a table in the platform has a domain and that domain is a link and it has a name and it has an icon and an icon color. And you are seeing the experience of creating a table, uh, but uh, let's not change that now. Uh, let's actually look at the tables. So you can see right now based on my access, because it's filtering based on my access, uh, I have access to 565 uh, records. And the one that I had just created, uh, if you recall, let me go back to it, uh, was called a demo table and it's in the sandbox domain. Uh, so if I go back to the tables table, you can see uh, Cinchi ID 2116 in the sandbox domain is called demo table. And it was modified uh, October the 1st, which is today at 1150, which is now, or three minutes ago. It was modified by me. It was created by me. Uh, and you're seeing that I chose an ambulance icon. Uh, I set it to be red. I put a description. Uh, and similarly, if I go to the columns and let's do a filter for where the table uh, contains a demo table. Uh, what you're seeing is uh, all of the columns uh, and you're seeing more than the four that I added. Uh, if I sort it by a system column, uh, you're seeing there's the four that I just added. If you remember, I added the name, a value, a choice, and a country. Country is a link, choice was a choice, uh, value was a number, and name was a, a text. Uh, and there's the descriptions and uh, whether it's a system column, which ones are mandatory, which ones are not. Uh, and you're also seeing that there are a number of control columns that are automatically added by the platform. So what is the version of the record? What is the draft if you turn on change approvals, if you reject it? These are all really control fields, like who changed it, who modified it, who created it. Uh, so if I go back into the table now, so we're back to demo table, and right now we're in the manage data screen, but let's actually go back into the design screen. So we're back as a builder and let's make some changes here. So I'm gonna say demo table, um, I'll just add a two to it, demo table two, and I'll change the description. And I'll say this is uh, just uh, another demo uh, and I'll change the icon to purple and I'll choose a, an anchor. Uh, and if I go to the columns, I'm going to, uh, let's say, delete the choice and change the value to be uh, amount. Uh, and I'm gonna add a new column called uh, whatever test and I'll make that a yes, no. Uh, and I'll just put a bunch of random keys in the, as the description. So I'm making a bunch of changes to the data structure. So let me go ahead and save that. Uh, now, of course, with the data that's already in, it's gonna preserve that. And if there was any dependencies on the prior model, those will continue to work because of the features of plasticity. So keep that in mind. I can change this freely and not break things. Uh, but uh, as you can see, those changes have taken effect. I've dropped a column, I've added the new column, I've renamed a column, I've renamed the table. Uh, so if I go back to the tables table and uh, let me just refresh this, uh, you're gonna see, that, well, now it's called demo table two. Uh, and it was now modified at 1154, and I can check the history of this, uh, and I can see that Dan created this table uh, October the 1st at 1150, and then modified it uh, at 1154, and you can see what I changed it from and to, and I changed the icon from an ambulance to an anchor, anchor. I changed the color, I changed the description, so on and so forth. Uh, and if I go to the columns and refresh, uh, you're gonna see the same thing. You're going to see uh, that uh, this is now called amount, uh, and if I check the history, you're going to see that uh, Dan changed it from value to amount and uh, reordered it. Uh, and if I, I, that was the only changes that I made. Uh, but I also added in uh, test as a new column. So if I go to the history of that, you can see it was created at 1154. So it's giving you this very granular access to the metadata. And if you remember, I deleted the column. Uh, well, I can go into the recycle bin and I can see uh, there's the column that I deleted called choice and uh, Dan deleted it uh, at 11.54 and hey, I can just go ahead and restore that column uh, or I can uh, delete uh, or manipulate the metadata directly in the table. So what you were seeing when I go back to Senshi through this screen, the design table screen, this is just an example of an experience. It's allowing me to manage that data in an intuitive way. Like I can have columns, I can rearrange them, I can change their types. Uh, but it's it's a bit of an illusion because it's just that magic of the, the data under the covers, that metadata. And that metadata is, is active in that it is continuously live in real time. Uh, so as the fabric is changing, if Joanne were to right now add another table, it's going to be added as a row. If I don't have access, I don't see it. If I do, I see it. And if I have access, I can see the history of change. Maybe I can't 
see all the columns. Uh, so it, uh, it is very powerful in that that metadata is actually data. So what that means is now you can query that data I can apply artificial intelligence to that data. I can have uh, predictive capabilities on that data. I can do trending and and uh, analytics uh, on that data. Uh, so as an example, I'll show you a, a quick little query that I built uh, called the metadata search. And this is just something that was uh, thrown together in a very short amount of time. Uh, but it's basically a query that's retrieving from the various tables. Uh, and what it's allowing me to do is filter based on any uh, any keywords. Uh, if I want to filter for a domain or a table or a column or even an expression or a security classification or a data type or filter in or out system columns. Uh, but uh, what do they call the, the table? So let's say I want to look for everything that has um, a country in it. And demo table two was one of them. Uh, so I'm just going to search for anything that has country uh, in the column name. And what you're going to see is that there's quite a few that have country in either the name or the description. Uh, and uh, so where is the one that I just added? Uh, it's in sandbox and there's demo table two. So row 29 uh, is the one that we just added demo table two country. It's a link and it's internal and I can click through to actually open up that table and see where it is. Uh, so that query, and we're going to cover queries in the next session, uh, means that anything I can do with data, I can now do with metadata. So I can do aggregations. I can do visualizations. I can do trending and uh, temporal queries. I can uh, essentially use that in ways that were not possible. Uh, and don't forget, that is both the technical metadata as well as the business metadata. Uh, so uh, really, there's an endless number of possibilities. Uh, but um, uh, that's that's all we'll have time to to show today. Does anyone have any any questions uh, on the idea of active metadata and what the potential uh, usage and benefits are? Dan, this is Rob. Um, who who when you pitch this, who kind of gets it first? Like, is there a role within an organization where they really latch on to this first, or is it? Uh, so uh, pitching the overall idea of a fabric is generally. Uh, an IT um, architecture head uh, or CIO or CIO minus one. Uh, it's ultimately someone who's looking at uh, in changing and influencing and improving their target state architecture as they deliver new capabilities. Uh, the idea around active metadata specifically uh, would be uh, of, of interest to them, but perhaps even more interest to those that are operating in a data governance function. Uh, the ability to um, you know, show me all of my data that has a PII uh, and uh, who ultimately owns that. Like to be able to just ask any question of that is, is kind of enabling that panacea for anyone in a data governance function. Does that make sense? I was on mute. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay, all right. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Joanne, uh, back to you to uh, to wrap and intro the the next session. Okay. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, this session will be available on demand, and uh, in a few minutes, you'll be able to register for episode five, which is building cross application APIs and reports in minutes. So Dan will give us a more of a hands-on experience. You'll be able to watch him build things and also ask your questions. So please join us for episode five. And if you've missed any of the other sessions, please feel free to watch uh, episode one, two, and three. They're all available for, available for you to explore and watch on demand. And if you have any questions at all, just feel free to reach out. We have a live chat that's on our website. You can always ask a question there as well. Cool. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you.